Father, thank you for the opportunity now to just take some time, get into the Word of God, and uh, Lord, just let it speak to our hearts. We thank you that we have so much to celebrate, so much to be thankful and grateful for, and Lord, we're praying that you will speak to our hearts and just bring life and hope and encouragement. Thank you for all that's gone before, but now, Lord, teach us from your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you about the gift, the gift of Christmas. Because that's really kind of at the heart of it. It's not all of the gifts that might happen over the next few days. You know, I shared in the email, Christmases were big at the McClendon house. With four kids, you know, we were beaten, you know, as you well know, but we were also rewarded. Christmas, I, you know, my mom was a big kid. She, she was an adult, and she was responsible when she had to be, but that's one of the reasons why we love being around her. She, had, she was a kid at heart. She loved all of the things that kids love. And Christmas was no exception. I mean, we went all out. Every child had a big gift. I mean, it was big. I, I, I got a couple motorcycles through the year. I mean, when you, when you start thinking about, you know, this isn't the only child. She, I mean, I don't know how they afforded it. We must have lived poor all year long so that once that year. But motorcycles and bicycles, and, and, and I remember one year a dune buggy. Literally, a dune buggy and, and, and all these other things. And, and uh, it was just something to look forward to. And then as you get older, it seems like, well, we lost it somehow. L lately, Christmases at the McClendons have been gift cards. <laughs> so I'm not kidding you. For the last five, six, seven years... I, we, I go, I meet my family that I hadn't seen in probably a year, and there is about five minutes of who got whose name, and we exchange gift cards. <laughs> and then we eat. And we did that, I don't know, you know, this seems really ridiculous. I mean, it really ridiculous. Um, and so I just learned, we're getting ready to get on a plane tonight and go back, and they said, we're not even doing gifts, so... It's not what it used to be. You know, I don't know if you remember the song or if you've heard the song through the season. It's not a sacred song, so I don't want to dwell on it too much, but the 12 days of Christmas and all those gifts. Have you read those gifts? And this is what a true love gives? <laughs> a partridge in a pear tree? Something milking something? Geese? Yeah, all of that. I... I don't know what gifts you'll be receiving, but I hope you don't get anything on this list. <laughs> I would imagine that when all the dust settles, and everything's said and done, it'll be easy to forget a wonderful gift that God has given to us. You know, as Christians, we come here and we know that there's a lot of commercialism, there's a lot of stuff that surrounds Christmas, the rat race and the drive and all of that. And I guess it makes it a little bit more endurable because we know that at the heart of it, when you strip it all away, there is a gift. A gift that never disappoints, a gift that never stops giving, a gift that meets your greatest need. It's the gift of God's own Son. And so I want to talk to you just a few moments we have left and you kind of break it down this greatest gift, the relevance, the reason, and the result. Guys, I'm going to take this out of order. I want the first point up. Don't, don't do the next slide, but the, we're going to do that one next. The relevance. What is, what is relevant? You know, so many people today, especially young people, and we think the Gen Xers and the postmoderns and whatever, and we're hearing more and more Christianity is not relevant. And they use that as a way to just kind of discount and to discard all of Christianity and the message of Christ and, and all of that. But I'm telling you, there couldn't be anything more relevant than what it is that we celebrate here every week. That the, that, that the whole story of Christmas and what it leads us to experience is the most 
a re- most relevant thing of all. You know, in World War II, it was big news when the Allies invaded Normandy. They call it D-Day. It was a big day, but it wasn't as big as the day that God sent His Son to this earth. On December 7, 1941, a date that's said to live in infamy, there's another day that still lives and is celebrated in the hearts of people, not just in one nation, but the world over. The day that Christ was born. It was big news when man walked upon the earth. Man walked upon the earth. Big news when man walked upon the moon. Sorry about that. I, I, I shot for it. I just missed it. I missed the moon and landed on the earth. Now, when, I, I still remember. I still remember laying in front of the television, four kids, you know, watching the grainy picture and thinking, life will never be the same. And as big as that is, and I don't want to discount it, the significance of that is nothing compared to the day when God fulfilled His promise. He kept His promise. A promise that was 4,000 years in the making. That was a day. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, you know, we see that the Scripture says He is, ooh, that's not going to work. Can you see that? Yeah, you can barely see that. Okay, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. I love that. The Scriptures tell us, the scriptures tell us that this is real. This is not just some story made up long ago, a fairy tale that, that, that kind of loses its significance over time. The claim of the Bible is that He is our Creator, that not only did He create all things, but He holds all things together. Jesus didn't start in a stable. His beginning was not that little manger scene. That He existed through all eternity past. He was in heaven. He, the universe was His his space, and yet he chose to invade planet Earth. Of all the places he could go, all of God's creation, he chose to become a part of this place. God, the creator of the universe, did something more relevant to our daily existence than you might consider. I mean, what he did forever changed the the history of planet Earth. The day He came. In Philippians chapter 2, in verse 7, listen to what it says. But Christ, that's who it's talking about here. Philippians 2, verse 7. Here it is. But Christ made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of man. The Bible says a day came when when God was coming, that the promise would be fulfilled. It was going to be the day that the Creator of all mankind came back to earth to become a part of it. The one that was not bound by space and time chose to become a part of that. You know, in the first service I was talking about, you know, the one that is, well, the one who has all power. You know, that's what we're told in Matthew chapter 28. All power in heaven and earth. All power. The Creator, the one who holds all things, the one that holds the universe in existence. Of all the ways that God could have chosen to come. Think about that. All the ways that He could have come. I, 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 you know, again, you play this game. If I were God, and I was sending my Son, I would do it with some pizzazz. I would do it with some flash, some lightning bolts, some shock and awe. But yet the Bible teaches He chose to become one of us. 
He slips into the human race through the birth of a baby. And you and got to ask, why on earth would the king of the universe come as a child? Why would he do that? Why, of all reasons and, and all the things that were available, what would be the reasoning of God to do it in, in that way? And you know, I'm absolutely convinced that any other way would have, could have repelled us, could have made us fear Him. He didn't come to scare us, He came to save us. God could have come in a way that would made us absolutely terrified, but He came in the form of a baby. Something like this. Who could be afraid of that? All right, I won't do this anymore. I brought that up in both services. Yeah, who could be afraid? But you know, this is the, this is the, this is the compelling thing about this story. You know, God, God wants to be loved. God wants us to be drawn to Him. And I can't think of a better way than to come as a baby. Oh, you know, young moms know when they bring babies around here, they got to hold on to them. You know, they, they, somehow we think they're community babies and they just get passed around. You know, when they get two or three, nobody wants them. But, but you know, babies, come on. But that's what it is. He came so that we could relate to Him. He came to strike a chord within our hearts that this is who God is. This child and the one that He will grow up to become. It, it, it's, it's all that. Why did He do that? And here's the good news about Christmas. Is that God is not distant, that God is not so separated, that God chose to live life the way you do. That God chose to do the same things and experience the same things as you and I have to do every single day. So that when life gets difficult, God can say, I've been there. I've done that. I know what it's like to suffer you know, betrayal. I know what it's like to be lonely. I know what it's like for people not to get it. I know what it's like to experience all of those things because I was a real person. I was one of you. This baby was God in human form. And yet, a baby changed the course of history. All time is measured, and still measured today, by His birth. The most significant event in history. It's relevant beyond all imagine. Number two, the reason, well, God came for our benefit. It's not for him. It's not for him. I suppose if it was for his benefit, he would have come full grown as a king, as an emperor. Instead of Bethlehem, maybe Rome or, or Jerusalem or other places. But this was not about him. It is about you. That is the message it is a gift not that we give, but that we receive. It's a gift that God gives. Why did He come? And the answer that we have to wrestle with is He had to come. He needed to come. You needed Him to come, and I needed Him to come. Without His coming, what would we sing about today? What hope would we have in our hearts? What future could we possibly look forward to? Knowing that all we have is 60 or 70 or 80 or 100 years, and that is over. You ever been to a funeral of a bunch of people who don't believe in God? It's a pretty pitiful place. I mean, it's not a good thing. He came because you needed Him to come. The Bible tells us really four reasons. Here's number one. To show us what He is like. I think this is probably near at the top. People had a warped sense of what God was like. That, that God was angry. That God was just waiting to punish them. That God had to be avenged. In fact, Jesus, Jesus in a couple places, He says, I have come to show you the Father. You know, people fell in love with Jesus. They sought after him. They chased him. They would sit on a hillside hour after hour 
just to hear him tell stories. To hear the stories of what the kingdom of God is like. They longed for that. Children loved him. Adults loved him. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I, I know uh, growing up, I had a disconnect. I thought, you know, God in the Old Testament, you know, he loved to burn people up and swallow them up and kill them off, and he was just mean and, and doing everything he could to destroy it. And then it was like, well, Jesus came, and boy, it's a different story now. But it's not. It's the same God to show us what he's like. You see, in nature, you can learn a lot about God. You know that? That's why we celebrate times when we can go out and be in connection with God's creation because all creation declares the glory of God. And you learn about God. That's why if the gospel is never preached in an area and it's completely unentered, they can still know about God. They may not understand all the plan of salvation, but they can know the power of God because they see it in all His creative work. They can see that He's creative, that He's organized, that God likes variety. You can learn a lot about God by looking at what He created. But there are some things you just don't learn about God until you look to Jesus. And then you see a fuller picture. What does the book of Hebrews says? That God in various times spoke to us in times past, but now in these last days has spoken to us by His Son. And it's not that there's necessarily anything that God wants us to know as much as He wants us to know Him. Jesus came to speak to us about who God is and what is in His heart. I love that. Nature doesn't teach us that God is loving. It doesn't. It's, it's order and it's, 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 it's interdependent, but it doesn't teach us that God is loving. It doesn't teach us that God is forgiving. It doesn't teach us that God has a plan for our life. But Jesus does. When He came, He shared with those who would listen what the kingdom of heaven was like and how God viewed mankind and how God believed in us and how He wanted us to be a part of his plan. Number two, he came to show us how to live. You know, years ago, this phrase was started, what would Jesus do? It's a pretty good way to live your life. It's not just what Jesus would do, it's what Jesus says and what Jesus thinks. If you want to be a disciple, you have to do what Jesus does. It's about being changed more and more like him. And so part of his, his purpose was to show us how to live. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24 and 25, Jesus speaking to his disciples helps us to get clarity on this. He says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, in other words, if anybody wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You know what's so significant about this passage? is Jesus tells us what life is really about. If you want to live a life of meaning and a life of purpose, if you want to live a life that will last and create some legacy, don't live it to yourself. If all your life is about you and satisfying your desires and your needs and what you want, you will have been a waste. Because nothing in all of creation lives for itself. And we are no exception for that. God shows us in His own life. I mean, everything about Jesus. It wasn't that Jesus said, look, I came to be served, but you should serve. He didn't, he didn't say that. He says, I came to serve. I came to love. I came to forgive. I came to do all these things. And if you want to know the real secret of life and have an abundant life and a wonderful life, do what I did. So he taught us how to live. Here's number three. To show us who we can trust. You don't trust someone 
you don't know. You know, that's one of, the, one of the things that I hear most about new Christians, new believers, people that have just exercised faith. They believe, they believe it's, 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 I guess it's easier to believe in God than to live with God, if you know what I'm saying. It's easy to believe in a powerful God. He's there, yeah, I look around. I mean, you almost got to be a fool not to believe that there's something that, that someone that created this and all of that. So, so we come to this place where if there's a God, then I need to serve Him. But then how do I live with Him? How do I get to know Him? How do you have a relationship with a God you don't know and you've never seen? And so Jesus came so that we might know Him. And the more you know God, the easier it is to trust Him. That's why we invite you to get to know him through his word. You see, you may not realize it. You might think, well, if Jesus would just come today. Well, he has. He has come. He lived among them for three and a half years, but we now have his word. And his, he and his word are inseparable. You can know God personally through his word, through the living Christ. And so he's taught He taught us how we can trust Him. Here's number four. To show us how to be forgiven. To show us how to be forgiven. You know, I think at the end of the day, all of us realize we've fallen short. That we don't live up to even our own expectations, much less God. That there's something in our heart that knows that we are amiss. That we are naturally self-centered. That we are naturally selfish. And that we don't live a very holy life. And so... We need forgiveness. But how do you get it? How do you experience this? Well, Jesus came to show us how we can be forgiven. Jesus wants to make you holy. He wants to forgive you and cleanse you because He wants to take you to a place that is holy. It's called heaven. And Jesus throws open the gates of heaven when he came the bible says he can take away your sin in first john chapter 3 and verse 5 and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him there is no sin isn't that a wonderful promise that's what jesus came to do i mean we're deep in the muck and the mire of sin, we're trapped, we're slaved, we're under that, that power of the law of sin and death. And Jesus came to take away that sin. It's quite a deal. Apostle Paul instructs us in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6, 7, and 8, who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. What was the cross about? You see, the cross was always a part of God's plan. It was always a part of the life of Christ. Every day, He walked toward the cross. He knew his future. He didn't come to be served. He didn't come to rule. He came to tell us how we could be forgiven. And for those of us that miss it, in all that he said, there is forever the image of the Son of God hanging upon the cross, suffering. And you have to ask, What did he do to deserve that death? And the answer comes back, nothing. He did it so you didn't have to. He took your place. He died and took upon himself the penalty of our sin so that we could be forgiven. That's called grace. And it's the only way anybody will ever get to heaven. Aren't you grateful for that? Never think that the the cross was free. Grace is free. Grace is freely given. Grace is offered to us. But never forget the price that was paid. 
Jesus didn't stay in the crib for very long. One day he found himself being nailed to the cross. And there's only one reason, because he loves you. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 says, In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. I love that. Verse 10 goes on. And in this is love. Not that we love God or that he loved us, or excuse me, but that, let me, I butchered that. I got to start over. You know, sometimes you just can't recover. You ready? Let's get it in all its glory. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation means that, that substitute, that, that uh, taking our place, our ransom. That's what the cross is about. That's what Christmas is about. It's not just about a little baby. It's about a little baby that would one day restore all things that we have lost because of sin. Christmas is not about Santa about a savior it's about a savior at the heart of it a savior that came to show you all these things well here's number four the result the result well what's the result and the answer is that you can know him through a relationship you see every other religion of the world seems to be a strategy about how to get to god how to earn god's favor how to get him to love you. How to get him to, to think that you're worthy. How to, how to earn his respect and all of that. Christianity isn't like that. Christianity is actually upside down when it comes to the other religions of the world. Christianity is not a God that is distant and far and whatever. And the Christmas story illustrates it best. It's God coming close. So close. That people could hold him in their arms. People could come before Him and worship Him. People could hear Him in the temple. People could receive of His touch, even though no one else would touch them. Because they were dirty and broken. That's what it's about. It's a personal relationship. You see, God knows everything about you. But He wants you to know everything about Him. That's, that's what he offers to us. That is what this is all about. God wants to be your friend. He wants you to be his friend. He wants a relationship with you. In fact, that's why you were created. I don't know if some of you are sitting here as parents, but why did you have children? Did you need more farm hands? Need some slave labor to work in the company business? No, that's not why you have children. When a man and a woman come together and they love one another and they express that love, they have children so they can love them. Some of you are going, really? (laughs) Yes. Yes. In case you didn't figure it out. Well, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to ruin this moment. I'm going to say, okay. No, you know, you ever, you ever reach a point where you're just in that moment of temptation, you're getting ready to jump, and you have that pause, and you think, maybe I shouldn't jump, oh, I should, this one says, oh, go, go for it, go for it now, I'm not going to go there, I'm not going to talk about children, other than to say that the greatest blessing of all is not what children give to you, but what you give to your children, of, of being able to love them with an everlasting love be able to just overwhelm them with love that's what it's about and that's what god is like in fact if you miss that you've blown your whole life look at romans chapter 5 in verse 10 and 11 for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to god through the death of his son much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life and not only that But we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received 
reconciliation. In a few days from now, you'll gather with maybe family or friends, and you'll exchange gifts. And you'll watch other people open gifts, and maybe you'll open one or two yourself. And when all the dust settles, and all the wrapping paper is strewn all over the place, don't, don't ever forget there is another gift that was given long ago. The, the worst thing of all is a gift that's unopened. Can you imagine leaving a gift under the tree and just never opening it, never embracing it, never, never connecting with it? And i and I got to believe that there's some, a lot, that they're going to leave a gift under the tree, as it were, under a tree that hung long ago on a hillside, a tree that shows us once and for all not only the depth of sin and the ugliness of sin and the cost of sin, but it's also a trophy to the depth of God's grace, to the love of God. How could God take something so wicked and cursed and use that to be the very trophy of his greatest love. In response to a gift like that, I don't know what else we can do but to worship him. Would you indulge me in one last song? Just a song of worship. A song that acknowledges that in light of a gift like that, there's only one thing to do. And that is to allow our hearts to be moved to worship.